رأيت نقول احنا هنا بيان. Je ne sais pas que اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم إني أفتتح الثناء بحمدك وأنت مسدد للصواب بمنك وأيقنت أنك أنت أرحم الراحمين في موضع العفو والرحمة وأشد المعاقبين في موضع النكال والنقمة وأعظم المتجبرين في موضع الكبرياء والعظمة اللهم أذنت لي في دعائك ومسألتك فاسمع يا سميع مدحتي وأجب يا رحيم دعوتي وأقل يا غفور عثرتي فكم يا إلهي من كربة قد فرجتها وهموم قد كشفتها وعثرة قد أقلتها ورحمة قد نشرتها وحلقة بلاء قد فككتها الحمد لله الذي لم يتخذ صاحبة ولا ولدا ولم يكن له شريك في المول ولم يكن له ولي من الذل وكبره تكبيرا الحمد لله بجميع محامده كلها على جميع نعمه كلها الحمد لله الذي لا مضاد له في ملكه 
ولا منازع له في أمره الحمد لله الذي لا شريك له في خلقه ولا شبيه له في عظمته الحمد لله الفاشي في الخلق أمره وحمد الظاهر بالكرم مجده الباسط بالجود يداه الذي لا تنقص خزائنه ولا تزيد كثرة العطاء إلا جودا وكرما إنه هو العزيز الوهاب اللهم إني أسألك قليلا من كثير ما حاجة بي إليه عظيما وغناك عنه قديم وهو عندي كثير وهو عليك سهل يسير اللهم إن عفوك عن ذنبي وتجاوزك عن خطيئتي وصفحك عن ظلمي وسترك على قبيح عملي وحلمك عن كثير جمي عندما كان من خطئي وعمدي أطمعني في أن أسألك ما لا أستوجب من الذي رزقتني من رحمتك وأريتني من قدرتك وعرفتني من إجابتك فصرت أدعوك آمنا وأسألك مستانسا لا خائفا ولا وجلا مدلا عليك فيما قصدت فيه إليك فإن أبطى عني عتبت بجهلي عليك ولعل الذي أبطى عني هو خير لي لعلمك بعاقبة الأمور فلم أر مولا كريما أصبر على عبد لئيم منك علي يا رب إنك تدعوني فأولي عنك وتتحببوا إلي فتبغضوا إلي وتتوددوا إلي فلا أقبلوا منك كأن لي التطول عليك فلم يمنع كذلك من الرحمة لي والإحسان إلي والتفضل علي بجودك وكرمك فارحم عبدك الجاهل وجد عليه بفضل إحسانك إنك جواد كريم الحمد لله مالك الملك مجر الفلك مسخر الرياح فالق الأصباح ديان الدين رب العالمين الحمد لله على حلمه بعد علمه والحمد لله على عفوه بعد قدرته والحمد لله على طول أناته في غضبه وهو قادر على ما يريد الحمد لله خالق الخال باسط الرزق فالق الإصباح ذي الجلال والإكرام فالق الإصباح ذي الجلال والإكرام والفضل والإنعام الذي بعد فلا يرى وقرب فشهد النجوى تبارك وتعالى الحمد لله الذي ليس له 
منازع يعادل ولا شبيه يشاكل ولا ظهير يعاضد قهر بعزة الأعزاء وتواضع لعظمة العظماء فبلغ بقدرته ما يشاء الحمد لله الذي يجيبني حين أنادي ويستر علي كل عورة وأنا أعصيه ويعظم النعمة علي فلا أجازيه فكم من موهبة هنيئة قد أعطاني وعظيمة مخوفة قد كفاني وبهجة مونقة قد أراني فأثني عليه حامدا وأذكره مسبحا الحمد لله الذي لا يهتك حجاب ولا يغلق باب ولا يرد سائل ولا يخيب عامل الحمد لله الذي يؤمن الخائفين وينجي الصالحين ويرفع المستضعفين ويضع المستكبرين ويهلك ملوكا ويستخلف آخرين والحمد لله قاصم الجبارين مبير الظالمين مدرك الهاربين نكال الظالمين صريخ المستصرخين موضع حاجات الطالبين معتمد المؤمنين الحمد لله الذي من خشيته ترعد السماء وسكانها وترجف الأرض وعمارها وتموج البحار ومن يسبح في غمراتها الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله الحمد لله الذي يخلق ولم يخلق ويرزق ولا يرزق ويطعم ولا يطعم ويميت الأحياء ويحيي الموتى وهو حي لا يموت بيده الخير وهو على كل اللهم صل على محمد عبدك ورسولك وأمينك وصفيك وحبيبك وحبيبك وخيرتك من خلقك وحافظ سرك ومبلغ رسالاتك أفضل وأحسن وأجمل وأكمل وأسكى وأنمى وأطيب وأطهر وأسنى وأكثر ما صليت وبارك وترحمت وتحنن وسلمت على حد من عبادك وأنبيائك ورسلك وصفوتك وأهل الكرامة عليك من خلقك اللهم وصل على علي أمير المؤمنين ووصي رسول رب العالمين عبدك ووليك وأخي رسولك وحجتك على خلقك وآيتك الكبرى والنبأ العظيم وصلي على الصديقة الطاهرة فاطمة سيدة نساء العالمين وصلي على صدقي الرحمة وإمامي الهدى الحسن والحسين وصلي على الأئمة المسلمين علي 
بن الحسين ومحمد بن علي وجعفر بن محمد وموسى بن جعفر وعلي بن موسى ومحمد بن علي وعلي بن محمد والحسن بن علي والخلف الهادي المهدي حججك على عبادك وأنائك في بلادك صلاة كثيرة دائما اللهم وصل على ولي امرك القائم المؤمن والعدل المنتظر وحفه بملائكتك المقربين وايته بروح القدس يا رب العالمين اللهم اجعله الداعي الى كتابك والقائم بدينك استخلفه في الارض كما استخلفت الذين من قبله مكن له دين, دين الذي ارتضيت له ادله من بعد خوف اللهم وصل على ولي أمرك القائم المؤمل والعدل المنتظر وحفه بملائكتك المقربين وأيدوا بروح القدس يا رب العالمين اللهم اجعله الداعي إلى كتابك والقائم بدينك استخلف في الأرض كما استخلفت الذي من قبله مكن له دينه الذي ارتضيته مكن له دينه الذي ارتضيته له أبدله من بعدي خوفه يمنا يعبدك لا يشرك بك شيئا اللهم أعزه وأعزز به وانصره وانتصر به وانصره نصرا عزيزا وافتح له فتحا يسيرا واجعل له من لدنك سلطانا نصيرا اللهم اظهر به دينك وسنة نبيك حتى لا يستخفي بشيء من الحق مخافة أحد من الخلق اللهم إنا نرغب إليك في دولة كريمة تعز بها الإسلام وأهله وتذل بها النفاق وأهله وتجعلنا فيها من الدعاة إلى طاعتك والقادة إلى سبيلك وترزقنا بها كرامة الدنيا والآخرة اللهم ما عرفتنا من الحق فحملنا وما قصرنا عنه فبلغنا اللهم المن به شعثنا واشعب به صدعنا وارتق به فتقنا وكثر به قلتنا واعزز به ذلتنا واغن به عائلنا واقض به عن مغرمنا واجبر به فقرنا وسد به خلتنا ويسر به عسرنا وبيض به وجوهنا وفك به أسرنا وأنجح به طلبتنا وأنجز به مواعيدنا واستجيب به دعوتنا واعطنا به سؤلنا وبلغنا به من الدنيا والآخر خيرة يا مالنا واعطنا به فوق رغبتنا يا خير المسؤولين وأوسع المعطين اشف به صدورنا وأذهب به غيظ قلوبنا واهدنا به لما اختلف فيه من الحق بإذنك إنك تهدي من تشاء إلى صراط مستقيم وانصرنا به على عدوك وعدونا إله الحق آمين
آمين اللهم إنا نشكو إليك فقد نبينا صلواتك عليه وآله وغيبة ولينا وكثرة عدونا وقلة عددنا وشدة الفتن بنا وتظاهر الزمان علينا فصل على محمد وآله وأعنا على ذلك بفتح منك تعجله وبضر تكشفه ونصر تعزه وسلطان حق تظهره ورحمة منك تجل لناها وعافية منك تلبسناها برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين إلى شرف النبي وأرواح أموات المؤمنين والمؤمنات أموات السامعين رحم الله من يقرأ الفاتحة مسبوغة بذكر محمد وآل محمد Brothers and sisters, uh, we will continue today's program. Um, we are blessed that uh, we have Sheikh Abbas Jafar, uh, who is delivering some difficult topics, but in a very simple way that all of us are, can understand in a very easy way. With this, I will request Sheikh Abbas Jafir to come to stage for today's majlis. Bar Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad salawat. Allah. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytanir rajim. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. الحمد لله رب العالمين وبه نستعين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعلى إطرته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد Mabad salam alaikum wa rahmatullah. Over the last few nights, we have been speaking about different aspects of the Quran and uh, taking excerpts from the surahs in the 30th and 29th juz to try to see how we can take these verses and apply in our lives, inshallah. information and you start to just live your life it doesn't mean you don't live you live just like the phone you pick it up and you get on with it but what it does mean is you remain ignorant of the full features of that particular creation what the human being can actually be you miss out on that so there are many people who say oh we are living a good life we are living why are you telling us we are not living but you are not really realizing the full potential with which Allah gave you unless you look at the user manual then model yourself on that learn from that you see um, I remember 
I, one of the programs I use, I have used for years and years and years is Microsoft Word. In all its different, you know, evolution, I've been with it throughout and used it. I think I can use it very well after all these years. Once my computer was playing up, it wasn't working, and one of my very good friends is a Microsoft engineer. So I said to him, Arif, why don't you come home for a cup of tea? He said, okay. So I said, while I'm making the tea, can you just check this thing? Why isn't it working properly? He said, okay. So when I came back, he was on my computer in, using Microsoft, but he was playing a game. He was playing a game in those days, it was called Flight Simulator. I don't know if you've heard of it. He was playing Flight Simulator. So I said to him, Arif, how are you playing Flight Simulator? My computer doesn't have this program. He said, no. Microsoft engineers using any Microsoft product can press three or four separate keys and can play a cut down version of, my, of Flight Simulator on any computer. So I said, how did you know? He said, because I have been trained by the manufacturer. Because I know the manual in and out. I know what your program can do, which you didn't know. You could have used it forever and you would not know this if you had not been taught by the actual manufacturer. So people can live their entire lives oblivious of what Allah has created inside them if they do not turn to the engineer who is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahu sallam. Or refer to the Quran. So, one of the things that I've been referring to consistently is this tafsir. Tafsir Tadabur al-Quran and Muhammad Hasnain tells me that it is now available here. This is the 29th Jews and the 30th Jews is also there. What the idea of this tafsir, just to, he said to me to, to introduce it. There are three or four things about it. Number one, for those people who want to read the Quran and understand a bit more than translation, you need to turn to tafsir. The trouble is that the Shia tafsirs are mostly in other languages, Arabic, Farsi, perhaps Urdu. And these are not always accessible to people. They cannot read in those languages. And also, they tend to be very voluminous. What an attempt has, the attempt here is to take from the main tafsir of Sunni and Shia and create a readable narrative of that particular ayah or series of ayat so you can get a deeper understanding that's the first thing and it's in English language so it's accessible to all our youngsters and everybody the second thing about it is that it relies and introduces the contribution of the imams of Ahlul Bayt to the tafsir of the Quran what have the imams taught about a particular ayat that has come up and the imam has discussed it and explained it number three if the imams have used a Quranic verse in a dua or in a hadith and have made a reference to it, not direct reference, but the reference is there to that verse, it is quoted here that the imam is referring to this verse when he says this hadith. So you get an idea of how imam is applying the Quran into context in real life, in advice he gives. Number four, it also contains summaries of the verses. Sometimes the verses tend to be couched in very difficult language and uh, you know reading it in one go it's a bit difficult to understand exactly what that passage is now talking about. So in simple English there is a summary of a particular section, each section, that this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said in these verses. And number five there are items for reflection that look these are the verses how can we reflect about them? How can we think about them in our life? Remember that you shouldn't be scared of reflecting on the Quran and finding personal meaning in it. This Quran has got a meaning in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's presence which nobody can touch. But it has grades of meaning which everybody can reach according to their own understanding. People sometimes feel, that, oh, if I put a meaning to that, maybe I, I put a wrong meaning to it and I, I could be sinful. But we need to understand what is allowed and what is not allowed. Tafsir means to interpret the Quran. This tafsir is a specialist subject. Mufassirin go and undergo training and they have developed skill sets and then they're able to do tafsir. So tafsir is not for everybody to do. But there is another thing which is called tadabbur. 
Tadabbur means reflection, contemplation. This is not only allowed for everyone, it is wajib on everyone. Allah says in the Quran, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنِ Why do they not ponder about the Quran? أَمْ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبٍ أَكْفَالُهَا Are their hearts locked up? So we are allowed to look at the Quran and try to derive and extract personal meaning. In fact, we are told to do that. So in this tafsir, you can make from a particular set of verses and you can make your own reflections and you should make your own reflections. What you can't do is say, okay, I've understood this, this is the tafsir of this ayah. No. The tafsir of the ayah is taught by our ulama and mufassirun. But certainly we can become more interactive with the Quran. And this was the way of the imams as well. When they read the Quran, they interacted with it. So for example, Imam Rada salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi wa When he would read an ayah that talked about paradise, Jahan, uh, Jannah, he would say, Ya Allah, make us from Ahlul Jannah. While he was reading, he would stop and say, Ya Allah, make us from these people. And when he was reading a set of verses about Jahannam, he would say, Ya Allah, I seek refuge in being from these people. Or when he read ayat that talked about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's qualities, he would say, for example, after reading Surah Tawheed, he would say, Rabbi. This is exactly how my Lord is. Right? So that is these things show a kind of interactive reading with the Quran, and this is important. So the Quran has many levels in which we read. One is just tilawa. We recite the verses in quick succession, and there is great barakah in this. One is a slower recitation where we look at the meanings of what we are reciting. And we think about them. And one is a very slow recitation where you read and then you sit and you think. What has God said? What, what is this saying to me right now? So for example, Ghazali in Ihya Ulumuddin, he was asked once, Abu Hamid, that how quickly do you read the Quran? So he said, I, there is a reading of the Quran that I finish every week. That means he was reciting one manzil a day. There are seven manazil. There's a reading of the Qur'an I finish every week. There is a reading of the Qur'an that I finish once every year. And there is a reading of the Qur'an that I still haven't finished. This is, he's showing this meaning that there are different ways. Sometimes we are in a group, we're reciting together, fine. Other times we are on our own, we can take a little bit more time. And sometimes we just say, I just want to work on this two or three ayat first. Just these two or three ayat, even if it takes me a couple of weeks to figure out what are they saying and how can I apply in my life? So this will help with that. My recommendation is that certainly do get this and keep it in your houses. And sit with it. One ayah, one... I've been trying to sequentially move us along on this journey and trying to look at different aspects of how we can use the Quran to make some change, as I said that this is the month, if there is going to be change, this is the time for it, inshallah ta'ala, because there is great barakat in it. Small intentions made by us, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us tawfiq in the holy month of Ramadan. Um, we spoke about this idea, as, as you heard from the brother, that in our life, we either have what we want, or we don't have what we want. Sometimes we are deprived. Sometimes we are granted. We should remember that these granting and deprivation have nothing to do with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's view about us. Because we have doesn't mean Allah is happy. Because we are restricted doesn't mean Allah is angry. Each of these things is a test. And that's all we have come here to do is bala. Uh, to undergo test. And depending on how we encounter those tests, it will exactly matter on how we start in the next world. This was what we were saying. So sometimes, shukr. Sometimes we are deprived. We do sabr, isn't it? Uh, we, are, we try to be um, trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's hikmah and wisdom in this. So, in fact, uh, one day Mawlana was reciting about sabr and shukr and how this is very important. 
this woman, she went home to her, she saying to her husband, you know, after listening to Mawlana, I realized both of us are going to Jannah. He said, how, how did you make that conclusion? She said, whenever you look at me, you do shukr. Whenever I look at you, I do sabr. And in this way, inshallah, we are both going to Jannah. <laughs> Please recite salawat ala Muhammad. In the introduction to the month of Ramadan, in that very beautiful speech that Rasulullah gave at the end of Sha'ban, which was mentioned by Amirul Mu'mineen and later on related by Imam Rada alayhi salam, it is well known khutbah of Sha'ban, Allah, where the Prophet said, you know what is coming this month of Ramadan? Do you know what it means? And all that and all. And how its days are the best of days and nights are the best of nights and the, its hours are the best of hours. Then he said, that, yeah, and he said, Anfasukum fihi tasbih. Because you are God's guests, you have to realize the, the host is not at all limited by what he is giving the guests. His pazirai is something that no other host can do. He says, Allah has decided, Anfasukum fihi tasbih. As you breathe in this month, he counts it as tasbih. As if you are doing tasbih. The very fact that you are alive in the month of Ramadan, you are already doing tasbih. وَنَوْمُكُمْ فِيهِ عِبَادًا Your sleep in it, he counts it as worship. So you can imagine that even at a zero position, you are already in the ibadah and tasbih of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what he has decided. This is how he's going to host us. So then, وَعَمَلُكُمْ فِيهِ مقبول. Your actions in this month, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts them easily. Remember, while I'm on the subject, when we do al-amal salih, any good action, there are two aspects to it. The first aspect is to do it correctly. So if we are going to do salat or fast, we have to do it according to the fiqh. We have to pray properly, fast according to the rules. But there is a second aspect to the amal which is more important than the first one. The first one is important, obviously. The second one is acceptance by God. Acceptance by Allah. Without that, the amal itself is naqis, is, is incomplete. You do the action properly, you follow the rules, but there is something missing in it and God rejects it. So the, the acceptance is equally or more important than the amal. That is why people should pray, Ya Allah, accept from us, isn't it? Even Zainab, salamullahi alayha, after the sacrifice of Karbala, which no one can deny that is, was, was accepted by God, but still, this was her primary concern. When they, left the, when they left Karbala, they were taken through the battlefield, and she came down to the body of her brother, didn't she? And she lifted him a little bit, and she said, Allahumma taqabbal minna hadhal qurban. Oh Allah, please accept from us this qurbani. Because if you don't accept it from us, all this has no meaning. This sacrifice has no meaning. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this month, Prophet said, wa amalukum, amalukum fihi maqbool, wa dua'ukum fihi mustajab. And your supplications, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts them more easily in this month. That is why this is a month of dua and the duas that we recite, the dua iftitah and many other duas are to be recited in the month of Ramadan to take advantage of this fact. That if there was ever a time to recite dua, it is month of Ramadan. Because duas are accepted. So then the Prophet said, Fas'alullah rabbakum bi niyatin sadika. So don't forget to supplicate and ask Allah in this month with clean niya, good niya, niyatin sadika, truthful niya, wa qulubin tahira, and clean hearts. An yuwafikakum li siyamihi, to make you successful in the fasts, kitabihi and in recitation of the Quran. فَإِنَّ الشَّقِيَّ مَنْ حُرِمَ غُفْرَانَ اللَّهِ The one who is denied forgiveness of God in this month is the most wretched individual. فِي هَذِ الشَّهْرِ الْعَظِيمِ Whoever leaves this month still with his sins on his shoulder is a wretched individual. Shaqi. Why is he wretched? It means he never in 30 days actually sincerely asked God to forgive him. Because otherwise God would forgive him. In this month, he is waiting to forgive. To go through the whole month means that you were present, but you never really thought about 
your sins. You never really showed shame and remorse. I never really told Allah, you know what? I, done, I have done wrong. I accept it. I put my hands up. I did not do what I was meant to do. I did what I wasn't meant to do. Forgive me in this month of grace. And Allah is forgiving. So, what I want to talk about today a little bit is this dua. Because really, it is a great gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, it's a simple connection between man and his creation, and his creator. Does not need any particularly special way to do it, except that you sincerely open your heart and talk to God. Of course, we have been taught by the Imams and the Prophet wasallam on how to, what are the etiquettes and the adab of reciting dua, that's fine. But even if you do not want to recite a formal dua, there is no reason why you don't start to talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's something we don't do, as a, generally we don't do this. We speak to God when we recite the duas, we speak to God when we do salat, but other than that, we don't. And yet, the imams were given to talking to God all the time. There is no reason why when you begin your day and you're driving to work, you don't share with God your concerns for that day, your aspirations, your worries, uh, your, your thoughts. Why not? Talk to him aloud. Back in the day, when you found someone talking to himself, you think that this person is a nutter. Nowadays, everybody says, oh, he's on Bluetooth, no problem. Isn't it? He's on Bluetooth. Yes, he's talking away. There's no one there, but he's on Bluetooth. Yeah, get on Bluetooth with God. How about saying things as simple as, Ya Allah, you know today, there are these, these, these things that I have to encounter. There are these, these things I have to sort out. Ya Allah, make it work for me. Make it come to fruition. Ya Allah, these are my concerns and worries. Suffice me against these concerns and worries. Why not? You know? I remember once when we were in Iran, youngsters uh, for ziyarat we had gone and we were blessed to meet one of the mujtahideen. And someone asked that, how come we find it so difficult to concentrate in salat? Give us some tips on how we can concentrate in salat. And he said that there are many things, but the, what he said was that don't talk to God only in salat. Talk to God all the time. And then, when you enter Salat, it is just a continuation of what you were doing all day long. Except you are doing it in a little bit more formal way. But you say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Amma ba'd, I was talking to you 20 minutes ago, I'm continuing talking to you still, and this time in Salat. So, when we compartmentalize our ibadat and our worship, then it's very difficult to find a link. We say, okay, fine, we have done the namaz. Khub, that is namaz is haq. Let's finish it. We have done the dua. Now we get on with our day. It doesn't have to be like that. No? It doesn't have to be like that. In Gujarati, even some of, the, some of the language we use, it shows this compartmentalization. Like we'll say things like namaz paraigyu. Namaz paraigyu means namaz is done. You know, tick box, tongue, namaz paraigyu. Roja rakhaiya. Um, it's not like washing dishes that you say, okay, dishes dhoaigya. It's not like that. This namaz paraigyu, you know, it's a constant thing. This parwanu thing is not right. Even, even we say du'as. Even in English we say, recite the du'a. So and so is coming forward to recite the du'a. Please welcome him with salawat. Du'as are never meant to be recited. They were meant to be asked. You should say, Bukhi Sahib, so and so is coming to ask du'a. Because that is what du'a is. When we start reciting, it takes the ruh out of what we are trying to achieve. Because it was never reciting in front of God. It was asking in front of begging in front of God. When we are begging and we, we keep that in mind, it changes the whole thing. Imagine if someone started and said, Brothers, I am now asking Duai Kumel. Everybody's mind would actually turn a little bit to a different area in thinking that, yes, it's true, we are asking. We are not reciting. So, dua is this connection that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of his mercy, out of his mercy allowed for people to be able to talk to him. Where is Allah and where are we? Yet he allows. You know, 
in there is a dua of uh, one of the munajats at the end of Sahifa. It's called the whispered prayer of those who remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Zakirin. If you look at the first verse of that, you think it has been mistranslated actually, or misquoted from Imam Sajjad alayhi Read it tonight if you get a chance. It says, Oh Allah, if you didn't command me to speak to you, I would never have spoken to you. You think, huh? Shouldn't it read, even if you didn't command me to pray, Mathalan, I would have prayed out of gratefulness. You know, I would have done it naturally. Imam said, I wouldn't have done it. The Mufassirin looking at this, explain it this way. They say, they give an example. Suppose there is a, a huge palace and a powerful king resides there. His power is known. And then there is a cleaner, a street cleaner who is outside the palace. He has never entered the palace. He's just cleaning the street. But one day the palace door opens and the king walks out himself. And he looks at him. He looks at him and said, you... Bring me some water. What's going to happen to that street cleaner? He's going to run trembling, get water. He's going to give with shaking hands. And then what will he say? He will tell, go home and tell his family, I swear, if the king had not commanded me to act, I wouldn't have dared to even look at him. Where is the king and where am I? How, how can I even open my mouth in front of him? But he ordered me. It is like this with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam Sajjad is saying, I would not have the courage to open my mouth in front of you if you had not allowed me. But Allah in His mercy says, my servant, speak with me. Speak with me. I am listening. Imam Sadiq said, if a person wakes up in the night, his eyes open up and he says, Ya Allah, you should know that immediately Allah answers him and says, my servant, you called me. Speak, I am listening. Speak, I am listening. That is how present he is with us, waiting. And we're going on with our lives as it is, you know, as if nothing matters. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is there. With all his glory and all his might, he's available 24-7 to us to turn to and to speak with. So we should get into the habit of that. You know, sometimes you read some hadith, they make you very ashamed. Very ashamed. In one of the hadith, where in the mountain where Musa alayhi salam spent 40 days speaking to God. Amongst that, in one of the speeches or in one of the conversations, Allah told him, Musa, I look at my servant and I manage his life as if he is the only single creation I made. Every one of my servants, I deal with him as if he is the only single one I made. And they look at me as if they have many gods. Can you understand? The irony of that statement. Allah has billions of creation. He micromanages each one individually tailor-made at every moment. And we have only one Lord, really, but we act as if we have many gods. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to Musa, even then, even then, I don't discard them for their rudeness. Because they are mine. I created them. In another place he told Musa, you know, when Fir'aun was drowning, the Quran says, he says, Al-an, and now I believe in the Lord of Musa and Harun, doesn't he? Is that what he said? Now that his last moment had come, he was saying, I believe now. At that time, Hadith says that his eyes caught the eyes of Musa as he was drowning. Musa salam had crossed. He was now waiting. The last of his people had gone. He was watching the Banu Israel, the... the but Al Firaun drowned. For a moment, they caught eye to each other. And in that, Firaun looked at him, and in that unspoken thing was, Can you not do anything for me? Can you not help me? Even though it didn't come out like that, Imam said he was trying to tell him, Is there nothing you can do for me now? And Musa alayhi salam turned away, the hadith says, he turned away in disgust, saying, Now, when all, after all I brought for you and tried to teach you, you were arrogant. Now you're drowning and you're looking at me as if he turned away. Now. At that time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to him, O Musa, you frowned and turned away. That is because you did not create him. I swear by my own might that if he had turned to me in the same way, I would have saved him today. 
This is Allah's love and mercy. He's waiting for us with such an invitation. Why we should we hesitate? We should take full advantage of it, isn't it? So, few things only about dua today. Uh, just as a reminder. What is dua, reality of dua? According to the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says reality of dua, and tomorrow inshallah we are continuing this because I've noticed that our time has run out. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala considers dua not about asking only. Because if you look at Surah Baqarah, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem, Ayat 186, وَإِذَا سَلَكَ عِبَادِ أَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ When my servant asks about me, tell them I am near. أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّائِي إِذَا دَعَانِ I always answer the supplication of the one who does dua when he asks me. فَلْيَسْتَجِيبُ لِي وَلَهْلِي وَلِيُؤْمِنُ بِي So let them ask me constantly and believe in me لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْشُدُونَ So that I can guide them. But you notice, he calls dua ibadah. And that is what dua in its first instance is. The recognition by a human being that I need Allah is ibadah. If he does not do dua, it shows arrogance. Man is arrogant. Especially when man has strength, he has resources, he becomes arrogant, whether in, uh, unknowingly or knowingly. He thinks, ah, I don't need anyone right now. When I need, I will turn to Allah. Right? So this arrogance to break it, you are told, ask all the time. Because human beings, by nature, don't like to beg. We don't like to beg. We don't like to show that to anyone else that I really, really need you like this. And we are told in hadith that for a human being to beg is aib, is humiliation. Except when he begs from God, in which case it is sharaf. It is honor. To beg from God is man's honor. To beg from each other is aib. So don't be afraid to break that little pride of yours and say, Ya Allah, really? I know with all my strength and ability right now, I know I'm so vulnerable. So I pray to you, Ya Allah, for your strength. And, and get to the habit of that. Inshallah, we'll build on this tomorrow. I want to speak about two or three other matters about philosophy of dua, how to ask dua, and why sometimes dua isn't accepted. Now we can continue with it. But this is something that I feel. Why do these children, right? Why do they grow up so weak? Why do they need us so much in the beginning? Why did we become, why didn't we grow to our full strength from day one? Why did we have to undergo a stage where we are needy? Why? To teach us. To teach us, as we look at these children, we realize how needy we are of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This child, if you left him, could not reach home. Could not, he would be lost without your guidance, isn't it? Without your, 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 um, your guardianship, isn't it? It's to teach us. Aga Bejiyat has something very nice, he writes in his kashkul, in his diary. Ay Bajad, may Allah give him Jannah, inshallah, was a great, great scholar. He says, it was a hot day in Qum. I was working in the Hayat. You know, in the houses in Qum and in Arabia generally, there's a main door, then there's like a courtyard. Like, you know, and then there is the main house, that Hayat. He was working there because it was hot. And he said, while I was working, next door neighbor, the bell rang for their house. And... Uh, the, the young boy went to open the door. So I could hear, but I was working. But then the man at the door said to him, I am hungry. Can you go and tell your mother to give me something? So he said, that boy gave an answer. I put my pen down and tears came to my eyes. This is Marja, great scholar. He said, that boy, what he said made me cry. You know what he said? He said to him, why don't you ask your mother? She will give you anything you need. And Agabajat said that I felt that look at this child. He is so confident that the mother will give him anything he wants. And it, the mother may not be able to give. Allah has assured us of the same thing. That I will give you whatever you want. When did we forget to ask God? 
When did we forget our neediness of God? When did we think we have grown up now and have outgrown God? We never have, isn't it? So we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to always keep us in this thought that we are not as strong as we think we are. We need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to constantly be able to turn to him in humility and to ask him inshallah ta'ala. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that in this month, this holy month, he accepts our fasts, he accepts our dua, those people who are unwell, who are sick, those people who are in problems, by the barakah of the month of Ramadan, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alleviate them from their problems. Wa akhiru da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Please recite the salawat ala Muhammad.